The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into Paraplanner AI. Ooh, I'm so excited about this. It's got that magic little letters at the end, AI folks. One of them is a serial entrepreneur with significant experience in the tech and VC world. He's joining us from Dubai and the other is joining us from Sydney, Australia, has been a financial advisor and has run a successful outsourced back office for financial advisors. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Dennis Konoplev and Alex Gasner. Woo! Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us, Peter. Yeah, Not at all. Um, this is, well, we've had some international guests, but I think this might be the most far flung of everybody that we've had. So thank you for taking the time out of um, what I'm sure is normal scheduling for you to join us here. So before we dive into all things um, Paraplanet AI, I'd love to just take a moment uh, to get to know each of you through your tech use. So Dennis, let's start with you. What is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Uh, that's a brilliant question. So our company logo is actually an emoji. So whenever I'm sending an email or a LinkedIn post as part of our branding, I'm using a brain emoji. So most use emoji by far. Best answer ever. <laughs> Fantastic. You can't help it. You have to be using emojis. I love it. How about uh, how about you, Alex? What's your emoji use like? Yeah, I probably can't can't steal that one now. But um, <laughs> mine would probably be the um, the sideways crying with laughter emoji. I think that's my most used one. There's a, there's a lot, lot of humour between mates and even within the business as well. You got you got to laugh at something at some point, right? I was about to say it's you know laughing or crying or the same you know the or both <laughs> the twice, one emoji. Yeah. It's like <laughs> it's it all situations, right? I love it. Now sticking with you, Alex. How about if you had to? You know, we're all so attached to our smartphones. They're just sort of really they rule the world, don't they? Or they rule each of us. If you had they to do. wipe everything off your smartphone and just keep three apps, Alex, what would you keep? Uh, so definitely WhatsApp. I use WhatsApp a lot throughout family comms, work, and friends. Mm -hmm. um, I'd probably choose Uber as well. I think I'm pretty dependent on that. Um, so I'd choose that. And then the last one would be my dad is incredibly particular about the type of apps that he use. And so the mm -hmm. last one would be Threema, which is a fully end-to-end -end encrypted app that my 78-year-old dad uses purely to talk uh, with me for no reason <laughs> other than just – you know, that's that's what he's like. So, so basically it's his own bat phone. Is that what it is? It's <laughs> pretty, like the, the, pretty much, yeah. yes. <laughs> that is that. Batman that's at 78. <laughs> that, that is fantastic. How about you, Dennis? What's what's your, if you had to, you know, get you know get rid of all the apps on your smartphone and keep just three, what would you keep? I'd probably just get rid of the smartphone. Um, it's, <laughs> a, to be honest, it's a distraction device and um, like it, it really does destroy productivity. But if I really had to keep an app, I'd... Uh, keep Google um, uh, Maps for getting around. Um, yeah. Uh, otherwise, it's like difficult to function, but all the other comps can go. 
Look, I'm with you with um, and you mentioned before we hit record that you you travel a lot and Google Maps for traveling. I don't know how we coped with traveling without it because Jesus, it just liberates you, doesn't it? Like it's so empowering in that sense. Um, the only thing yes. it doesn't do, which I wish it did, is is maybe sort of shaded sections for areas you shouldn't walk through. You know, like I, <laughs> I have got caught out a few times with Google Maps where I've just blithely wandered through an area going from A to B and happened to walk through the most dangerous dangerous part of a city in that progress yeah, process. That's so, what definitely happened. I think a, a lot of people got caught out two days ago or it was with the um, Optus internet uh, dropout. So Absolutely. I think we all needed the old Gregory's to get around at that point. We <laughs> must, did it. Must have and- been there. Oh, it was crazy because it wasn't just internet, it was their phone lines too. So if you had to pack with them. So we had team members who couldn't even contact us to tell us that the system was down. Like like what carrier pigeons? Like what's the backup for that <laughs> yeah, situation? Yeah, exactly. we are back to that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, it's crazy. All right, let's dive into Paraplanet AI. Um and We'll get, Dennis, I'm going to get you to tell us about how this came about, but I'd love to start, Alex, with you just to give us some context. Just for everybody listening, they may not have heard about the tool. Um, tell us where it sits in the, you know, sort of advice tech space, um, you know, what you guys might line up against, if anything, um, in terms of that category that it exists in. Yeah, definitely. So the best way to explain it probably, I would say, would be we're kind of that wedge between the financial planning software and like the CRM. Right. Yeah. We're not trying to be the financial planning software and we're not trying to be the CRM. We want to sit at that workflow level and try and yep. drive efficiency and productivity throughout automating those processes, right? So how an advisor engages his client and spends a lot of time doing that, the back and forth, once they get data, how they get that data into the financial planning tool, into the CRM, and how they engage with their back office support staff. So that's probably the best summary or, or, or way to summarize it. Um, okay. So then, so Dennis, then in terms of, you know, you're one of the co-founders of this and, and I'm curious and you have got a history in all sorts of different types of tech. This is not like your, you know, advice tech crazy. Um, you've done it through multiple industries. I'm curious, what was the problem you saw? And then, you know, what was it about, what was that journey where you realized this was a potential solution? Yeah, so um, when my when my co-founder and I, Fauzi, met, um, we were working on a on a previous venture, like for for a client that was in fintech, and it was actually through working together we we kind of fell in love with working with each other. Um, something I would really strongly advocate anybody looking for a co-founder love who you work with. Um, it goes a long way. But uh, we fell in love with working together, and but for both of us, we were having a bit of an existential crisis in the sense of trying to figure out. You know, you know, the big questions, the meaning of life, what would we do if we could do anything? Because um, anything is possible. And we realized that at the crux of everything, understanding money and understanding how money works is uh, like liberates you and enables you to do whatever you like. Um, and we went down the rabbit hole of trying to build a personal finance management solution for ourselves, first and foremost. Yeah. Um, and we we tried many different iterations. Um, uh, you know, uh, we both have an experience in uh, building software, um, uh, in building software in a way that's actually usable. But we couldn't build something that we ourselves were happy with, let alone giving it to anybody else. Yeah. Um, and when we when it, it was missing something in a personal finance management solution and it's only when we put it in front of other people that we got the feedback it's like it's it's great it gives me the number but it's missing a human element Mm. and that was the unique insight for us that look a digital solution might be fantastic for certain people in the market but like um tech can only go so far um it's really like um the psychology of money and having someone who can guide you through that process is almost more important than the number that comes out. Um, so that's when we pivoted. Uh, we, we were a small team. Uh, it was just myself and Fazi at the time. So we pivoted into actually building tech that helps financial advisors. And that's how paraplanner.ai came about. Um, we came out with a core thesis that like whatever tech we build ultimately should enable an advisor to focus on their client as much as possible. Um, and uh, like where we get the name paraplanner.ai, obviously paraplan uh, like helping out with paraplanning tasks. Um, but uh, we're using different technologies, not just AI, um, 
actual AI because of its association with automation, but we're using different technologies to essentially do heavy lifting um, uh, where machines are better than humans. So enabling humans to focus on the human parts and em- enabling machines to focus on the machine parts. I love that idea. It's um, There's an expression I use all the time with advisors and even in the podcast, you know, a bionic advisor. Like that's really what we should be aiming for, right? And, and interestingly, um, for those of us that are, you know, either finance focused or maths focused, you know, my background's actuarial studies, right? So uber maths geek. Um, it's easy to think it's about the numbers. Um, but in, in reality, what we have is a relationship with money. That's really what it's about is our relationship. So therefore the human element is so important to your point. Um, and it actually makes me feel a bit better that somebody outside our game has come to that realization too. Like that's a. <laughs> We might say that within advice circles, but um, it's interesting that's the conclusion you got to. So then let's talk about the realities of that. Like what does that, you know, look like for a primary user? Is the expectation then that the primary user would still would be the advisor or are you seeing it being somebody else in the practice? Who's the who's the main person utilizing the tool? Um, that's a great question. So um, at the moment, we, we have a very specific ideal customer persona or someone we're targeting with our software. We are um, we are US focused at the moment. Mm-hmm. We are targeting uh, um, solo or, or independent and solo practices. So typically, it would be a lead advisor who's doing the advice, doing all the admin, um, doing the planning work. Um, and the reason why we're like focused on these individuals is that they are probably the least served in terms of focused on being an individual, like compared to uh, small and medium sized practices or larger practices. Um, They don't necessarily have the support and firepower of um, all the ensemble of tools that a large practice might have. um, And they definitely won't have the human support or the resources to hire human support in most cases. So like, like with any kind of tech startup, you focus on um, who's got the biggest pain point. So we are looking to help them out at the moment. Um, uh, And we do provide uh, both like on our side, human and um, AI enabled assistance. So this is kind of where Alex's uh, fantastic background comes in. We kind of balance the human and automation element to help them out. Um, But ultimately, uh, the way we see the technology developing, it could help um, even small and medium or larger enterprises collaborate around clients, but also automate their workflows. So Paraplanner is evolving just from a pure automation tool to an automation and collaboration tool. Yeah. Okay. So I'm always about the what is it acting like, what does it look like or feel like, or what's it actually doing? So you, we, you were talking about it almost being that glue or that that wedge between you know an advice system and then say a CRM in reality um what does that look like like what's it what's it doing between those two things or or in that middle step there yeah of course so um we we actually started out designing it very much to mimic um the way the humans interact with other humans as in conversationally it's the quickest way to communicate information and it requires almost zero knowledge of learning a new system so um power planner uh, uh up until uh yesterday actually lived in uh email conversations so if mm-hmm. you had a task to delegate to paraplanner.ai um you would just draft a short email the way that you would draft it to an existing um admin or planning assistant um mm-hmm. uh with a request and you would reply conversationally you could forward the emails um uh, it, it had access to the CRM and planning software so it instantly knew like how to action items. All you had to do was tell it what to do uh, via an email. Um, as of yesterday, we've rolled out a chat functionality, which it just speeds up the iteration process and, and helps helps you get instant feedback in terms of what you can and can't do. I'm sure we've all seen uh, conversational uh, AI apps come out recently, and it's it's uh, it's just becoming the standard for uh, for seeking and getting things done. So very human it approach. Is, isn't it? Yeah, and it, but it, I think also what I love about that too is, um, you know, we're all being told that that email is the Trojan horse. You know, it's it's email bad is sort of my summary of <laughs> what everybody's saying from a cyber perspective. So it makes sense that you you might move out of that so that then you know people can just be interacting through the direct chat functionality. I mean, all of that sort of makes sense. So, what might be the sort of thing that that somebody's asking? Like, what what would I type in? 
uh, to give you an example, a client's uh, given you a, a portfolio statement, um, 80 pages long, um, and like m- uh, market ticker symbols and uh, market values. Um, uh, currently, as a financial advisor, I have a couple of options. Option number one is I sit and spend over an hour manually entering that data into other systems. Um, option number two is um, I delegate that to uh, my uh, admin support member. And they spend an hour entering it into systems. <laughs> Or option number three is um, as soon as you've received that uh, information, whether it's been by email or secure upload, uh, you will get an email notification from PowerPlan and AI saying, like, I see you've received a document for so-and-so client. Um, uh, I've already extracted the data. Here's the data. Do you want me to put it in your CRM? So you're, you're instantly saving uh, an hour for the financial advisor and being proactive. Wow. Okay. So, and I'm assuming this is really any numerical form of data, right? So if it was a, I don't know, it could be an extract from a bank account or it could be like any, like would paraplanner.io just view that the same? Is it like, yes, we've just extracted that data for you? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we process we process almost any type of document and um, are we uh, it just just so the listeners and you can understand we're not, we're not trying to uh, build out every single capability in house. We do integrate with best of breed software. So when you use paraplanner.ai, you're actually leveraging some of the top tools out there that are consolidated in this really easy to use format. Um, so it can be pretty much any kind of document from, uh, numerical financial statements to, uh, in- uh policies, uh, W2s, so on and so forth. Okay. And so, so just, Taking that question further, then is the intention that it will be leaning on so that the point is to extract just the numbers, or is it literally somebody? You know, we could load up, you know, a, a product disclosure. I mean, product disclosure statements here for insurance. You know, I mean, you could knock yeah. somebody out with one of those things. Is the intent that then you could end up loading something like that in and then ask it questions? Is that where you're going, or or is that a separate type of? Use no, that, 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 that is correct. So, um, it would at the end of the day, you're trying to extract and understand useful information from a variety okay. of documents. Like, if, if, we, if we put ourselves in the shoes of a financial advisor, it's like, what would be my ideal scenario? And the ideal scenario is like, um, I, as a financial advisor, I'm spending my time engaging the client, mm-hmm. providing them value and hand holding them. But, um, all the data that's coming in, wouldn't it be amazing if it was just extracted and put? in ready for use into any system and that's the experience that we're going for now like uh, being realistic we we're not doing this in real time at the moment there is a learning curve um we uh you know we really pride ourselves in our accuracy so after any machine work is done we still have a human check to provide like uh, a feedback in the loop um that's kind of baked into like the service um it's yep. non-negotiable for us um, but yeah, ultimately the experience is get, get a financial advisor focused on the client, maintaining that relationship and all the admin and uh, uh, kind of manual data entry work uh, is done through PowerPlanet.ai. Okay. So uh-huh. Alex, I'm curious that, from your perspective. Well, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to add add into that as well, that like, I think that, that element of that human touch at the end or just to double check the data is really important because, you know, we've heard from advisors before that even when they enter the data into the systems, if, if that was three months ago, they come back and go, was, was the data right? I'm not entirely sure whether or not I had entered that correctly. So having that human element, almost like that last quality check before it goes out, you you have the confidence and you know that the data is accurate. Yeah. yeah okay. Really important. Look, it is. And if, if, um, any any time you start distrusting the data, it's it's always a challenge, isn't it? And we've we've you know in our game, data feeds from providers of, of like they're the bane of everybody's existence. Um, so Correct. it's always been a problem. Um, and so Alex, I'm curious, you know, with your uh, you know understanding of of the Australian market and what a lot of advisors are uh, the way they're operating. Um, I'm curious how you like. What's your example of how you see an advisor who right now is is using certain tools and, and operates a certain way? How do you see that you know playing out in real life for them if they use something like Paraplanet or AI? Yeah, I think um, you know with with the target client that we have at the moment being those smaller smaller firms, maybe even yep. solo independent. You know, those are, those are people that eventually get to a point where growth and scale is just an issue. Right, and they're wearing every hat in the business. They 
you know, have 60 to 70 clients, they experience this pain point, they're home at seven or eight o'clock at night with a pile of paperwork that they need to get to or get through um, and even sort of comms to get back to clients, et cetera. Um, being able to free them up from, from, from their time being spent on that and having it spent on building client relationships and being able to invest back into the business mm-hmm. to grow and scale. I think that is what, that, that's our kind of like one of our core mission statements, right? So there are probably, I don't know how many hundreds of fintech tools out there, particularly in the US market, but you know, th- there needs to be kind of a point where you don't have 15 or 20 different tools and you use a few very core ones that add true value to the business. Right? Yeah. So we're trying to sort of fit in that space where we can solve, um, you know, the admin and planning tasks for, for the advisor and I guess eventually just have them have the capacity return back to them to be able to scale and grow the business. So just from what I'm sort of gleaning from talking through what it can do, is it then – more likely to be weighted towards a new onboarding of a client, you know, where it's it's when that's new information to you. We don't have access to anything yet. We can't see it online. We can, you know, like that sort of position where they're just downloading a whole lot of information at us, sort of thing. Is that sort of where you're seeing this applying? Certainly initially. Uh, yeah, it's it's when we look at like what what are the two biggest pain points for financial advisors in terms of like the most time invested um that's what we've looked at like before like or to start a relationship and then after a relationship started um onboarding is the the first major use case that we tackled um to get clients set up to collect all the information because that's where a lot of live work is done yeah. the, second, the second big area that we tackle is client review meetings so in the united states Um, They typically take place every quarter, half a year, or uh, once a year. Now, if you imagine you've got 70 clients, I'm I'm sure any advisor uh, listening to this will will know this pain point. Um, You're spending an hour to four hours preparing for that client review meeting. You're you're going through your emails. You're collating information from your planning software, your CRM, bringing it together, making it it easier to understand. And... um, what, what if we could cut that down and provide you with a summary of the key points that are relevant specifically for that review meeting? Now you're going from you know uh, one to four hours of prep time suddenly down to minutes uh, where you're not having to trawl through all this information. That's more time that you can spend with your clients. That's all the heavy lifting that's been done. Um, and yeah, again, you've freed up, freed up time. So those are the two key areas that we've been uh, focused on. Okay, so... Just to sort of lay that out in a, a, bit, a bit granular and practical example, and I apologize for that. I'm just one of those people that translates into it. Right, if I'm going to do this right now, how would it apply? Then, you know, we've got an annual review coming up. We run the reports for the different products that or the accounts that the client has. We've got that sort of, you know, maybe it's the last 12 months of, of how things have gone. And what I'm hearing is that really this is for the situation where, which is most situations, where you don't have that automatic data feed into your advice system, you know, so that's not all just going to be in there, is instead of somebody taking that information out of, you know, uh, platform website and then entering into next thing, that's what that's what this tool is for. It's to extract that information and then push it into whatever tool um, might then use that to then do the analysis that otherwise you'd do. Have I summarized that correctly? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so if, if you have your... Um you know, most of your communication is taking place with your uh, with with the client by email, right? So um, already step one, trawling through all the client emails and trying to summarize what has been the conversation since our last meeting is a really uh, big pain point. So um, a common task uh, used for AI is to summarize things. So mm-hmm. we look at all the past interactions and we summarize the key points that have taken place along the way. We, we compare that with notes from the CRM um, and notes from planning software, um, any progress to ultimately produce a short report um, for the financial advisor, which tackles and reminds them, you know, this is my client. This is my client profile. Here are the goals and objectives that we've discussed with them previously um, in the last meetings and here are their historical goals and objectives. What progress have they made? Um, has anything come up in between this meeting and our previous meeting that we've needed to tackle? You know, they they might have had 
like an unexpected situation that was not captured in the goals, but was captured in the communications. Mm-hmm. And then finally, any action items or points of progress that they should have made between uh, the meetings. So as an advisor, you're going into that meeting prepared with a full picture of your client because um, you can't remember every single detail. You can't remember all the communications and you can't track all the progress using existing tools easily. So we use a summarization feature or the reading feature first to understand the data and then the summarization to provide that summary. Uh, most importantly, because again, you, you could say, well, there's a bunch of tools out there. They're, they're all uh, kind of AI based and um, what, what makes yours different um, to provide this summary or like why is Power Plan and AI different? It's different because it's not a generalist tool that is designed for any use case out there. It's a specialist mm-hmm. tool specifically designed for financial advisory and planning. Um, and that's the world and context that lives in. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's useful. So Alex, then, um, in terms of the type of, well, we, we mentioned that your sweet spot initially is the sort of, you know, one, you know, single advisor or smaller, you know, independent sort of practice because it, that's where the bang for buck for them will be. Like it's really going to, you know, give them more bandwidth. Is there anything though that you would say if somebody's going to take on a tool like this that they should either get organized or do differently or set, like, is there any sort of pre work that makes, that means somebody can really, you know, get some, uh, value out of the tool faster? Yeah, I think um, sort of one of the things that I've experienced um, and I'm, I'm sure that everyone, every every advice business that has ever engaged any third party or fintech or service provider can understand that, you know, the success of that relationship is very dependent on you investing the time and effort into that relationship, right? <laughs> yeah. So the client onboarding is certainly about a bit more of a hand-holding process, right? Where we meet perhaps weekly, perhaps it's only a 20-minute conversation, but it is going through the things that are working, things that might not be, and then also what are the tasks that are sitting on your desk right now that you would really want to get rid of. We're still early days Mm -hmm. um, in our business, which is like I think a good thing because as we onboard customers, we really want to listen to them, right? We really want to like understand what their pain points are and get feedback from them so then that we can develop and implement that feedback into our product roadmap, right? Yeah. So we don't want to go off and build all these solutions and then go, hey, here it is, go use it. Um, those conversations um, and that onboarding, that handheld, held, handheld process is really, really important for us. So just understanding the cl- potential clients, kind of understanding that if you're putting 20 to 30 minutes into this relationship a week, then it can work quite well. But it's certainly not something that you would just buy off the shelf, expect it to do everything for you, push a button, and all of a sudden, your business has tripled. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, I think that's probably the most important kind of uh, thing to note. I was, I would say, yeah, yeah, okay. And I am curious, um, and this might be something for you, Dennis. That so certainly here, and I'm sure it's happening globally. Um, there's a lot of talk about utilizing client portals instead of or transitioning towards interacting with clients via portals rather than email. And a lot of that is about security, um, but also convenience, you know, I think we all dread opening our email inboxes, you know, so if somebody can just quickly respond to their advisor on an app or whatever, you know, maybe that's easier. So I'm curious for you then and the tool, what does that mean? Is that something then that's set up as, you know, part of the initial onboarding where it's like, okay, what tools are you using to communicate with clients and can we sort of, you know, interact with that or, or extract information? How does that work? Um, yeah, so it's, it's it's funny you mentioned that a, a client comms tool is something that we wanted to tackle very early on. Um, it does come up often. Um, email is highly inefficient, and having having a compliant tool that allows you to converse with your client would be fantastic. That's the theory. The reality is is that it's um, the question you ask: What three apps would you keep on your phone if you uh, deleted everything? Um, Alex mentioned he would keep WhatsApp. I'm sure most people keep a method of communication like that. Like nobody's keeping a dedicated tool just to communicate with their financial advisor. Sure. Um, unfortunately. Um, uh, and I think it will be a while before we get to the point where you can use third party tools, um, that are compliant like that, uh, for, for consistent communication. Um, email is just very ubiquitous. Um, it might not be the best tool, but it's something that is very ubiquitous. Um, and anybody can send anybody an email. 
if you if we talk about a client portal that goes beyond just the communication um, where i i see a lot of solutions trying to like add value you know you show dashboards and you show progress and um all these kind of things we did very 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 extensive user testing um we spoke with advisors that do use these tools and the, mm. the feedback that we got every single time was a client is paying me to do the work and they're not going to sit there and like look at a client portal. Um, they don't check them. Um, they've got usage statistics. They just don't log in. Um, and that's, that's, that's not the way that users want to interact with that. Um, if they did, they would go for a digital only solution. And as I mentioned before, like, you know, the digital only solution isn't necessarily appealing to the mass market. They want a human involved. So it's, I'd love to see that. Um, uh, it would help us like greatly standardize communication, but <laughs> it's, it's going to be a while and it would just create a mess as well for advisors. Like they, they will have to check their email inbox, but at the same time, they've got this other tool. And like I, I mentioned at the start, that, that might have been uh, confusing to some of the listeners, but hopefully now it's making a bit more sense when I said we're building an automation tool and a collaboration tool that lives like close to the email. This is why we're doing it. We're, we're not trying to split the attention and focus of advisors. We're actually trying to consolidate more things for advisors so they have a single view on their communications and their entire practice and automation. And it's a yeah, it's an interesting um, consideration, is it? Because it's certainly the you know concerns around email and and the push from compliance and and even from you know PI insurers is all about that security issue. So I'm sure you know the listeners like Peter, you need to ask about security. So so um, in terms of then this this um, will be interacting with and absorbing and feeding back some pretty um, private information um, for clients. So um, how have you got comfortable on that level of security to protect not just us as advisors but clearly our clients as well? Yeah, so um, I guess two words about my uh, my background that might be relevant. Um, uh, I majored in privacy, security, and data governance, and uh, studied under uh, one of the top, uh, should we say, top researchers in the field in in the UK. Um, uh, and my thesis was also on this topic. So for me, it's a very like a specific point of passion, and the level of security and compliance that you have to adhere to um, and just both technically and morally in the UK is like, and in Europe is one of the highest standards in the world as it mm. is with Australia. Mm. So this is at the forefront of any decision that we've made. And what does that actually translate into? So number one, we have an AI that forgets. And I know that that sounds a little bit weird in the context of technology that can forget, but we have an AI that forgets. Um, basically, we don't store any information um, about clients ever. So we're not a um, record of truth um, or store. That's why we connect to other systems, um, to CRM and planning software. So after um, our machine has processed uh, a request, maybe extracted some information, it forgets it ever did it. Um, there's no storage. There's no reuse. And so um, if we were asked to basically say, well, how long do we store it? It's a, fr it's a fraction of a second before it's gone. Um, number two is we have um, stages of filtering set up for information. Um, so if you have a document that comes in and it's raw source, uh, from, from the source, um, you have a lot of personally identifiable information in there that you don't want anything processed. So we have an initial step which actually removes any personally identifiable information of the skates uh, before conducting any further processing. So um, uh, when we use like other tools and commercial models, we're never sending them personal information. Um, and then finally, well, you could ask the question, well, the value of an AI business could be determined by its ability to train on user data, like how are you handling this? And what we do and make use of extensively is synthetic information. So um, synthetic data where we've um, used the original data source, deleted it, but we have produced a synthetic version of that data um, that doesn't match with the original source, but we use that for training models um, so we can still get fantastic output, but without mm -hmm. ever actually revealing personal information. So, it, yeah, data, data security is at the core and data privacy is at the core of absolutely every decision we make. 
So, and and I'm going to simplify this extremely, and I am no expert in this at all, so I apologize if I get this completely wrong. But when you talk about like a synthetic version, it's it's like converting something that may have a very specific number into something that's, hey, it's bigger or smaller than that. Like, is it sort of narrowing it down, um, you know, just taking off the detail of the, the characteristics and just almost like tags that might apply to that data? Is that sort of what it's like? How does the synthetic data thing work? Yeah, so uh, when when you have synthetic data, you have, let's say, the original data, like um, of the, uh, uh, a name, uh, an age, um, a, a number um, that in, it, in its original form, synthetic data, uh, and it, let's say you have 100 records or 1,000 records of that kind of data. Synthetic mm-hmm. data will resemble the original data, but it's been transformed into something that doesn't match the original data set. So if you took the synthetic data and looked at it and, let, let's say, looked up individual data points, um, they would never match with the original data set. So you have something that um, in its essence resembles the original data set, but in, in practical terms, like, is completely useless. Like, if any of the records were accessed or uh, used for training, um, you would never be able to reverse engineer and get back the original result, uh, but you okay. would still be able to get the outputs that you're looking for. Okay, so it's some sort of facsimile version that that um, takes away that sort of um, migration. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, Alex, then talk to me about um, you know you've seen practice or or businesses go through this. Then I am I'm sort of interested on some you know sort of weird use cases or some things that surprised you about the way that they managed to use the tool. Like, what's that journey been like as as you actually get people utilizing? utilizing the tool and sort of being onboarding as, as they, um, you know, get to put it into the practice. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I don't know. I think that a f- a f- quite a number of practices have just started very simply trying to yep. test the waters and, and kind of dipping the toe in. Right. They want to, they want to, they want to test to see the capabilities first, but also it's almost like when kind of like these first LLM models came out and you had that ability to sort of prompt chat GPT, it, was, it wasn't exactly, obvious what you might use it for right Mm. and so there was a window there there was a chat window um and go for it essentially um and so i think that they even found that a lot of users started to move away from it a bit because they just didn't understand how to engage with it properly it was it was new technology right yeah and so in the same kind of respect our clients kind of when they do get onboarded they start very slowly with quite simple tasks and then they move up in complexity as we go and hence, again, is why we touch base every week to go through those types of scenarios. You know, the technology, like in its complete form, is probably quite transformational. Yep. And I, I, I don't know if every industry out there is ready for that full transformation, right? So our, our biggest kind of question internally recently has been, how do we bridge that gap between the technology and all of its capabilities versus, well, the actual user and what they want to use it for? So, yeah. again, that handheld process of, I don't want to call it education because it's not ed- education, but it is just discovery of what the capabilities are. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a big point. So, we're kind of uncovering answers to questions we, we thought maybe we knew, but, but we technically probably didn't um, as we go. So, coming back to your question, I think that um, we're discovering every week new ways that advisors want to use the tool. Um, and that's really exciting for us. And look, it is an interesting, it's such an interesting point. And the more I read about what's going on and look, we'll just use the, the catch all AI because we know it's more than that, but let's just use that because it's what people have as context. But I think the best skill that any of us could have with any of those things is just curiosity. Like you've just got to be curious to go, I wonder if, you know, like I'll just give that a whirl. And I, certainly my experience, even with chat GPT, look, the more curious I got and the more things I asked or the way I asked them, or, you know, like you, you, you actually become a really good um, briefer. You know, when you've got to brief a designer or brief it, like you can, the output is so much better when you're better at writing the brief, you know? And so I think with these sort of tools, it's learning those skills. And so probably that's one of the biggest challenges, isn't it? Is because, we can't just be who we were before, even with a tool like this. We've got to learn some different skills to then be better be able to take advantage of them. Yeah, and we're not walking around constantly thinking, oh, what could ChatGPT do for me right now? No. <laughs> like, let me just outsource that. Well, it's the same with Paraplanner AI, right? Yeah. You know, advisors aren't sort of sitting in front of their clients saying, okay, how do I use this tool now? 
so that that prompting and and kind of like discovery process we want to, we want to do that um you know collaboratively and so so dennis you you guys talked about being in the us but clearly we have we have young Alex here. He's based in Australia. So, is are you testing this in? So, have you got um, practices in Australia getting used to the tool as well? Like, how, what's that approach? How's that all working for you guys? Yeah. So, we um, uh, aside from the US, our most commonly submitted like request to get access to the platform comes from Australia. Um, I think we get a couple of hundred of advisors from the from Australia every single month who are reaching out to us. Um, we, uh, as paraplanner.ai, haven't launched in Australia, but yep. um, we have, uh, well, we're in the process of giving uh, Alex and um, his his existing practice scale up um, uh, access to these tools. So um, just shameless plug, if anybody does want access to like fantastic service and uh, to, to get access to some of those tools, um, it will be coming through Alex as well. Uh, yep. But yeah. Perfect. So, because I do think uh, with any of these tools, to your to what we were just saying, then um, the early users who are curious enough are the ones that are going to find that thing that you guys didn't even think of. You know that application, and it it won't necessarily even be advisors. Like I find the gems for us in our practice come from the support team because they utilize something and they go oh, and suddenly they've freed up a whole day. Like, yeah. like, wow, okay, <laughs> I, that never would have occurred to me as a way to utilize the tool. Exactly. So it's sort of letting people, you know, go a bit wild and, and get a bit creative and, and encouraging that um, that journey that's clearly going to be powerful um, going exactly. forward. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. So, okay, so Dennis, w- what's the – What's the future then look like? Like, is there some blue sky world peace things at the end of all of this? Or like, where's it heading for you? What's the, what's the next stages? But also, you know, where is it heading, in, you know, further down the track? Uh, yeah, like I've, uh, like I've alluded to, like we, we are focused on the, like, uh, the automation and communication part um, at, at the end of the day. Like that's where most of the work gets done. And if we can uh, automate directly where you communicate, like it opens up a realm of possibilities. But in terms of um, where this could go, um, uh, I I just see a huge opportunity um, in, in several uh, spaces. So number one is in the solo kind of independent financial advisory space, which is severely underserved. We're just seeing a lot of fragmentation of the uh, tools that are being used, the processes, because at the end of the day, um, it's just one person. It's not. Mm. It's not possible to to cater to everything. Um, it is a very, it is a tough industry to to tackle and a tough segment to tackle um, because it inherently doesn't scale. But at the same time, it presents like a huge opportunity. And uh, uh, like for me. Like, I love seeing the transformation in someone's practice when they've gone from being completely overwhelmed uh, as an individual to, you know, suddenly having time to like focus on their clients and get new clients. Um, we have we have been asked quite extensively, like, you guys are building amazing software. Are you going to build, you know, a CRM or planning software? Um, it, it's it's a possibility, but maybe not an immediate one. Um, there are some very established players, and um, I, I think. Uh, I think the opportunity that exists in front of us like doesn't necessarily mean that we need to uh, go out and build a CRM today, but maybe one day. Um, uh, it depends depends on what happens in the market. And the, the obvious one is uh, Australia. Like um, uh, I think uh, I think we want to bring uh, Paraplanner.ai as quickly as we can uh, through Alex to the Australian market. Um, um, the market is far more regulated, and should we say your level, <laughs> your level uh, is well, it's on a whole different level in terms of how, what needs to be produced um, and uh, yeah. how work is done, and it ultimately presents a barrier to the average person having access to solid financial advice. And um, at the end of the day, that's 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 all financial advisors want. They want to provide an amazing service to their clients, but if you've got if you've got all this heavy lifting that you need to do and it just makes it economically inviable to take on certain clients, then, you know, if I've ever heard of a cause to, to fight for, I think that's definitely one. Yeah, and it certainly is a um, 
it's a frustration because I think, you know, lots of us would love to be able to, you know, either reduce fees or keep fees competitive, you know, all those sort of things. But like you say, when you're continually legislated and then also potentially, you know, tools don't keep up with what we all need and then providers who we're interacting, well, they're a bit slow too. Like it's, you know, there's so many layers where the poor advisor sits in the middle of that and like, would you all just sort this out, please? Like, (laughs) why is this so hard? And I think, it is such an interesting industry in that sense where I see a lot of either innovation or progress or true transformation occurring at these small, you know, individual advisor practices, but of course, not empowered with the funds or the weight to actually get something built or to get, you know, so it's, it's such a strange environment because really the pe- people that are going to come up with those almost batshit crazy ideas that would be wonderful aren't the ones that are going to have the resources to then have that, you know, create an impact across the industry. So it is exciting to to see more tools like this come up that are trying to empower those people. I'm like, yes, 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 we want you to do more. Or what are you doing? Let, let's just solve this problem for you. You know, let's just give you back some of that bandwidth that is doing things that isn't really advice anyway, right? It's not actually what yeah, advisors cool. should be doing, you know. Um, yeah. And Alex, I'm curious about what your take on this is, you know, from – your deep understanding of the market here. Where, what do you see that opportunity being? Where do you see that going um, for the industry here? Yeah, look, I think, you know, the QAR represents a big shift. It, it was about time uh, mm-hmm. as well. Like we, the, the pendulum had swung way, way too far in one direction. Yeah. And I think now it's swinging very much back into either equilibrium or back sort of towards the, the advisor side. So I personally think that, if you can have tools that are going to drive the efficiency and productivity to give you 10, 20 hours a week more or your support staff more and you can see more clients scale and grow, I think there has never been a better time to be independent. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's never been a better time to be a small independent financial planning firm, right? Um, yeah. I think you'll be able, you'll, you'll see in the next, well, X amount of time, in the next few years, an advisor might be able to look after 100 clients today. They might be able to look after three, four, five hundred 500 clients in the future, right? Right. So, well, who, who knows, right? If you, if you have more time to grow and you can put more advisors on and leverage their time, then that represents an opportunity. And if you, that helps you to reduce costs to serve, well, then it opens up another market, right, for financial planning advice. So the consumer is going to win as a result of it as well. So I, I think it's a really exciting time. I think it's particularly exciting to be that small advisory firm that may have been struggling for quite some time. And I think the tide is absolutely shifting. Yeah, it definitely is. And I think what's become, I mean, I've sort of, you know, as somebody who loves all the tech, hence hosting this podcast, um, but yeah. loves watching it and trying it for years, you know, always happy to test something out or take a look at it, even things outside the industry. What I'm excited about too now is that I think actually the advantage has shifted to the small. I actually think now, given how quickly things are changing. Given all the things that you have access to now, and this is a great example, then small practice or small dealer group or, you know, small environment where we can get together, make a decision and act (laughs) like that has some real power to it. Whereas the bigger, the bigger groups where, you know, the, the crazy democracy environment there and all of the layers of red tape. And I just think that the weight of that is, is potentially going to drown them over time just for this type of thing. You know, like it's the ability to see something, yes, assess, yes, cl- carefully think about it, make sure you understand the risk, make sure you understand the security, but then implement, get value, you know. I think um, little is going to be the game, I think, going forward, even though that's not necessarily what the industry is saying. You know, there's a lot of talk about consolidation and those sort of things. I'm not sure that's how it's going to play out. You know, and I'm I'm starting to think that armed with the right tools, these bionic advisors are going to be able to really go far um, and have a huge impact. So, Dennis, is there anything we've missed? Is there any features or elements or things to be aware of for the listener aside from clearly reach out to Alex and and if you're keen, you know, get in touch with him? Is there anything else though you you want to cover off? I guess, um, yeah, the, the, if, if anybody wanted to try paraplan.ai, the best way would be uh, to sign up or, or contact us uh, via our email. Um, we do have the onboarding process that Alex described before. Um, we mm-hmm. are friendly. We don't bite. Um, we, uh, we, we've seen all sorts in the sense of people who um, don't even have a checklist trying to run a practice um, all the way through to like hyper-organized individuals. Um, so we can help out in any situation. 
um, that's the power of being a small startup that we can really care about each uh, advisor. So um, yeah, please please reach out if you need help or if if um, if even if it's not for powerplanner.ai specifically, like we we do a lot of research into other tools that help advisors within the tech stack. And if you want to have a chat about a specific tool that you are looking to investigate, um, like we're really happy to explain the pros and cons, how it works, how it integrates with your tech stack, like anything to make you more efficient. Perfect. Anything else, Alex, from your perspective to cover off? Well, I think that's I think that's pretty much covered it off really well. Beautiful. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more, which I'm <laughs> confident you probably will, then uh, the the website link and the episode will be in the episode show notes along with um, the LinkedIn uh, profiles for both Dennis and Alex. Um, I'm sure you're going to get some people reaching out to you, but it sounds like really, uh, you know, any of us here in Australia, we should uh, hunt down Alex and uh, get him to talk to us about how it works and so we can onboard us and basically, you know, we can all semi-retire because we're going to have all this time available. I'm personally <laughs> Very excited about that. I'm already planning what I'm going to be doing with that time. So <laughs> thank you both uh, very much for joining us here on the show. And I'm really excited to see more advisors either being able to do more or potentially, you know, be able to do less and really enjoy it. So thank you so much for your time. And yours as well. Thanks, Ben. Thank you so much. So ooh, ooh, that was interesting, right, folks? I'm curious, is anybody out there listening been one of these early testers um, of paraplanner.ai? Um, this is a perfect example, like a really early stage tool where the Ensemble platform and getting on there and sharing your experience with your peers and basically, you know, having a bit of club where we all share, hey, we're going on this journey too. Let's talk about what we've discovered, where the value sits, um, what's worked, what's not. This is a perfect example of a tool that we can do better together, to be honest. Um, and so I'd love to hear your take if you are already on that journey. Um, and I'm sure others would in the community. So please head over there. Feel free to tag me if you post in the Ensemble community tag me if you're using Paraplanner AI because I'd love to know about it. So um, please do that. In terms of my thoughts, there's sort of two things that stood out about about that conversation for me. One was an expression that Dennis used that I think is something we should all start to learn a bit more about. And it was the expression AI that forgets. Now, a lot of the AI most of us have been um, sort of consciously using, uh, which would be something like chat GPT, is it's actually we want it to learn from what we're saying. We want it to get better, better at um, you know, either analyzing what we're saying or coming back in a certain tone. So as an example, um, feeding in the way you write so that when you ask it to draft, a, you know, an expression or a paragraph or, or even an article, it's learning from your very words. So the specificity of what you say and how you say it is actually really relevant. So that's an AI that we don't want it to forget, right? We want it to be learning as it goes in that sense. Um, whereas what Dennis was saying here is, you know, that some of this AI is going to be AI that forgets because it's going to be being given some of this private information. So that was interesting to me. I'd, I'd not quite heard it put that way before. So I think that's something we could all you know, maybe get to understand better and ask those questions. What does it mean? Um, you know, how does that work? I think there's some education for all of us, um, you know, down that down that path and really getting a better sense of the reality of that and what risk or not it represents. So that was the first thing. The second is some of these tools are just going to require us to be super duper curious. Like, I mean, deeply, you know what? I don't know whether I've quite got a handle on where the value is, but ooh, it sounds interesting, right? And I know that's not everybody's bag, but honestly, um, some of these have just that sense of, wow, if people took the time to just play with it a little, um, then you'd work out very quickly whether it was going to have a big impact and you would help them work out where else it could have a big impact. So it doesn't mean you do that straight away, but what I would say to you is, you know, almost having that as part of your plan is, you know what, we're going to invest the month of March, I'm going to have somebody that's going to spend some time with the team, maybe with Alex, and we're going to take a look and really see whether this could work for us, right? So it doesn't mean you've got to do it now, but put it in the plan. Have a think about it. Whether it's this tool or any number of other tools, 
we can't necessarily wait until they are perfect and have everything sorted out because the minute things are sorted out, the next thing's going to come, right? The next new fandangle thing. So having this willingness and ability to give things a bit of a try without taking too much risk or investing in too much change in maybe even your process just yet, um, I think will prove to be value in the future. Uh, that may mean that there's a person in your practice that you just assigned to be a guinea pig, right? <laughs> All right, this one's up next. That's what you're testing this month, you know? So you might have somebody who's willing to put their hand up to do that. They may even find that really fun and love that responsibility. So just have a think about that as, as a, a sort of a, a different mindset. Uh, that we're all going to need. Um, and it sort of naturally leans into, you know, my next, next section in the podcast, right? The curiosity corner, because I believe this is such a big part of how we're all going to have to behave going forward that, you know, each, each week I'm nudging you to try and think differently and look at something different. So I think this is a perfect example of where maybe a little bit of, of that is going to need to be applied. So this week. Bionic Advisors. Um, there is an interesting app that I'd love you to have a, have a look at and let me know what you think. Um, this is one for you as individuals, but I think it is such an interesting example of something very specific that they're trying to help people with. And the app is called Sleep Town. And you can find it at sleeptown.seekrtech.com. And Sleep Town is just a little app that wants to help you build healthy sleeping habits, right? So what happens is you go to bed at a certain agreed time. So this is for people, one type of person might be, gee, I end up sitting up on my phone and scrolling through my phone and I don't go to bed when I think I should. All right. Well, this app says if you go to bed at a certain time, then when you get up, you'll have the opportunity to construct some buildings. So it's like a gamification, right? Now, if you don't behave within the within in the sort of rules of what you've established of what healthy sleeping is, then the buildings you might have been working on that you've enjoyed as part of the game could be destroyed because you've failed to achieve your set goal. Yeah. And then if you do achieve your goal consistently, so you build better habits, then you get to build really rare and interesting buildings, right? So it really is pure gamification of building a new, better, healthy habit. So I'd love you to check it out. Maybe you've already used it. Um, uh, maybe you've got a huge town you've built with Sleep Town um, because you're such a wonderful sleeper now. Uh, but I think, you know, these tools that really do help us transform our well-being, I think, us, aside from being wonderful for us as individuals, I think the more that financial advisors understand these tools, the more likely we are to come up with a similar one for the public that we just help would really help their financial well-being. So please do check it out. I'd love, 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 love to hear what you think or if you've used it successfully or somebody you know has um, and let's keep these ideas flowing and let's keep trying new things out. Well, that's all we've got for this week, folks. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you're ready to achieve zen in the world of advice tech, then please be sure to encourage uh, your dealer group to reach out to me to hear about my new keynote for 2024, the zen of advice tech, finding balance in the digital age. Now, this has been a world where, you know, Technology can sometimes feel overwhelming. You may even feel that way after the previous discussion. And during this session, I'm going to show uh, you how to streamline your tech stack and in, and really enhance client relationships with only as much tech as you need, um, while also applying a sort of really mindful approach to tech mastery. So, you know, let's embark together on a path to a really more focused, more efficient and rewarding operational environment. So if you're curious, please re reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD. P-E-I-T-A-M-D and I'd love to have a chat. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, Advice Explorers, stay curious.